You mentioned that this room is special. Why? Uh, so this room is an extremely stable environment. The experiments we do are really, really sensitive to everything changing around them, temperature, the Earth's magnetic field, air pressure, and so this room is designed to protect against all of those changes. Cool. Like in office space, it changes a lot, right? Yeah, if you're in, if you're in an office, your air conditioning temperature is going to change by like a degree or two degrees over the course of the day. This room will never change by more than 0.1 degree. Why? Because you, is atoms that sensitive or? Everything cute? in the room is really sensitive. So what you see here are all the pieces of equipment that we use to trap and then control single atoms, trap and control the quantum mechanical state of those atoms. Every piece of equipment here is really sensitive to temperature, to air pressure, and so we need to keep them very, very stable. Is it because like um, qubits, I'm going to call them quantum bits, qubits, yeah, qubits, is super sensitive to change? Well, the qubits themselves are really sensitive, but like it gets hard right away. Even before you've got the qubit, when you're trying to control it, when you're trying to first capture that quantum bit, everything that you use in order to accomplish that is also sensitive to the environment. Okay. And then once you have it, it's, it's also extremely, extremely sensitive. All right, can you show us the, the tools or everything? Yeah, you're sure. These are gizmos. There's good stuff around. So we have laser systems. These are custom optical systems that we use to get just the right color of light for the atoms that we trap. And that light is sent either across the table in free space or in these little blue cables and yellow cables that are uh, called fiber optics. It's like the fiber optics that makes up the non-existent NBN. Oh, so this could potentially be the NBN. Just it could be. <laughs> it's like a really special, weird version of it. Oh, so how much is like this room alone? How much? Is, how much have you um, guys spent on it? Just, just the room is about ten million dollars. Ten million dollars. Just the room, not the stuff in the room. Not the stuff in the room. Oh, just because the controlled temperature is the 10 temperature, the way the floor is constructed, the way the walls are constructed. It's a perfect circulated room. It's a it's a really, really tightly controlled room. Okay. It's isolated from everybody else such that even people walking in the hallways is decoupled from the laboratory. Wow. That's why you have that special machine door later. Yeah, okay, the door, sure. that, that door is because if you if you have a door that swings open, yeah. when it swings open, it controls the air airflow. changes the color of our laser. Okay. They're really sensitive about their lasers. It's we're, it, we're very picky because we don't... That laser does not like being messed with, right? That That's laser that. doesn't like being messed uh, with. It's not cool. Uh, this is one of our tools. It's called an ion trap. So all those lasers that you saw feed into this system. The lasers enter and cross right in the middle, right underneath this black tube. And inside of that, we can trap one atom. Okay, just to describe like quantum computing, what is it in its most basic, basic core compared to the current computer systems that we have now? Yeah, the, the general idea is that if you can represent information using this weird bit of physics called quantum physics, you get access to a whole host of phenomena that allow you to process information in a way you can't process on a standard computer. So quantum computing promises to solve certain kinds of problems that regular computers can't solve. It's not like it's just bigger or faster or a little bit better. It's not like going from a you know, tool core processor to a quad core processor. It's really building a computer that's fundamentally different. And we do it using trapped atoms, trapped ions. Okay, because there's a different theory, because in the other lab, they're using circuits. Yeah, that's right. So a colleague of mine named David Riley uh, has a research program where he makes quantum bits using electrons that he captures in an electrical circuit, kind of like the circuit board that you have in your, in your mobile phone or in your computer. We do it in a different way. We make what looks like an electromagnetic bottle where we can capture one or a few ions, a few atoms, in space. And then we can tickle them with laser beams and microwaves to make them do our bidding. All right, um, the like whole premise of your, your thesis, of like uh, this lab itself, is you want to make it stronger or robust. Yeah, so, so the, the kind of fundamental problem that drives almost all research in quantum computing right now is that the quantum bits, the things that carry information, break very easily. They're really, really fragile. And so our work in particular uh, is a complement to all the other work going on around the world where we try to make the quantum bits more robust, more stable against all the crap going on around them in the environment. Even though this room is really stable, 
they still suffer from environmental fluctuations. We try and kill that. How long has this lab been open for now? We only moved in here in December of 2016. And what is your hopes with this lab? Because I know that you're partnering up with other labs because they have a much bigger quantum computer. Yeah, so so uh, there are certain parts of the community that really try to make a bigger quantum computer. The record right now is about 20 quantum bits, 20 of these fundamental logic units, and that's at the University of Innsbruck yeah. in Austria. Uh, we partner with them to do this kind of research where we develop kind of the software that makes these systems more stable. Actually, we call it firmware, quantum firmware. Uh, it's the software that runs below the view of the users or the programmers to try and make the hardware do what you want. I wish I brought my mic with me, but pretty much it's kind of cool. I don't it's understand. It's kind of cool? It's super cool. WTF. I'm, it's like, <laughs> I, I'm trying to digest the information all here and I see lots of lasers. There's lots of lasers. Lots of lasers. These are like individual these, lasers. These, well, these are all the optical components. These were just bolted down for transport, but these are lenses. These are things that change the polarization. How much is like, I only give them because I'm trying to like see how much they are, but these are especially made for this. So a lens like that will be, uh, think a think hundred dollars, okay. right? And something like this, maybe $500. Um, a laser like this is about $250,000. Why? Why is it? Uh, it's a very, very special laser that puts out a color that's very precisely controlled with a whole bunch of other parameters that are exactly what we need. Uh, it's actually, it's originally made for welding metal. Welding, we, welding we, metal. We use it for something different. Whereas this one is like, I can't go put my eyes next to yeah, it. That one's on. That's like alive at the moment. Yes. Yeah, so and it's invisible, but it's on at the moment. Yeah, but there are infrared lasers, so you can't see them with your naked eye. But uh, if you put your eye in the beam, you'd be very unhappy. Yeah, you'd be um, blind pretty much. Well, yeah. Um, so what's the purpose of this one compared to that machine? Well, so what we do is we separate some of the lasers. Uh, we put... Um, uh, certain colors over here and then we pipe the light using these fiber optics over to other parts of the room So we're in the process of scaling up because we're gonna we have one iron trap running